Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. As you know, our fraternity has sustained a great loss by the death of our brother, Frederick J. Whitecamp, on September 1, 2018. While we realize that no expression of sorrow or of grief can undo the inevitable work of death, while we acknowledge the feebleness of anything we can say to a leave of pain that can only be healed by time. And while it is true that the life of this fraternity will go forward despite the loss we have sustained, it is fitting and proper that we should pause to pay our last tribute to our brother who in life was joined with us in the great bond of our fraternity. and immediately became aware of his name in various documents that were circulated. And then I became clerk in justice of my chapter and corresponded with the uh, executive office. And then in 1988, there was a vacancy in District 13, which at that point in time was part of Illinois and part of Indiana. And I contacted Fred and ask if I could be of assistance. And he said, well, would you like to be the district justice? And so I accepted and served for the next four years. And I had a privilege that, other than the oldest ones of you here, probably will never get to have. I got to go to district justice training at the White Camp Malibu Beach House in 1988. What an absolutely, and I don't use this word often, awesome experience it was to be there. The hospitality that Fred and his family extended, the absolute precise way in which everything uh, was organized and executed, and the training we received uh, was superior. I served for District Justice for the next four years, 
and he had numerous interactions with Fred. I had attended 11 Five Delta Conventions, and he was at all of them, except the last one. And he had this remarkable personality that when he would see me at a convention, he would come up and shake my hand. And it was like the reason that he was at that convention was to see me. As it was for so many other people, he had the kind of personality for that moment, you were the most important person around. Fred was a giant in our fraternity. And he left such an incredible uh, imprint on our fraternity. It might not exist today, but it hadn't been for his leadership in what it uh, did. More than anything else, <clears throat> he made it to be the world's greatest legal fraternity. He had to be one of the most organized people on the face of the earth. A successful lawyer involved in banking and the executive director of our final fraternity. <clears throat> Fred was more than a great mentor. He had thousands uh, and thousands of friends. And perhaps the greatest witness to that <clears throat> was at the 1992 convention, and there was briefly a slide, the Big Daddy Bash, where I believe it was the largest turnout at any Phi Alpha Delta convention in history, to say, thanks, Fred, for what you did. <clears throat> it was an honor to know him. It was a privilege. John, thank you for sharing your dad with us. And as many of us would say, Fred White Kim with a damn fine pack. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Our next speaker comes to us via email for the reason you will hear. Brothers and sisters, if John is reading this, I have been annoyingly delayed in Chicago and will look forward to seeing you all shortly. I want to, to be there with you to speak about and honor a man without whom Pat as we know it would not exist. I have many fond memories of the times we spent together over the years and just wanted to mention a few that stand in my mind. Fred Whitecamp was an extraordinary person. His entire life was devoted to the service of others. He had many affiliations, but I feel certain that his main love aside from his family was PAD. In truth, PAD was also his family. I first met Fred Whitecamp when I was a law student, and at that time the executive office was in my backyard in District 3. And so I had the chance to spend time at the office picking up whatever materials I needed for my chapter and just generally learning all about the inner workings of PAD. Most especially, I was able to get to know Fred better because the building he owned housed his law office in front and the PAD office in the back. When I was elected international secretary, Fred took me under his wing to make sure I succeeded in that position. I was so thankful for the, that the, the truth is that he did this for countless brothers and sisters. Fred was always there to mentor us, and during his tenure as executive director, those of us on the board learned a great deal from him. I think it's safe to say that all of the past board members, and especially the past IJs who served while Fred was ED, would echo these sentiments. As many of you know, Fred has a beautiful beach house in Malibu. He was forever hosting PAD events there, including DJ training. The actual training sessions took place in Fred's office, but the highlight was dinner and a sleepover at the beach house, as well as admission into the White Camp Beach Club, complete with t-shirt. In the last several decades before he retired, being executive director wasn't a job for Fred. And although it was his job, he had a thriving law practice, and I, as I mentioned earlier, was involved in many community organizations. The work Fred did for PAD was truly a labor of love. I was amazed by Fred's incredible work ethic and organizational skills, something he clearly imparted to John. What a team they were practicing law together and keeping the fraternity going strong. It served as a great example for me when I first started practicing law. 
Speaking of the White Camp team, I firmly believe that there would not be no pad today if it wasn't for the two of them. They have always gone above and beyond, but especially so during periods of crisis in order to keep the fraternity going. Twice we lost our executive director and both times they stepped in as interim executive directors so that the fraternity members would not suffer while the search for a new executive director took place. When our beloved IJ, Stan Cohn, was murdered, it was Fred's reassuring voice on the other end of the phone. And without any fanfare, he held the board together, guiding Jack Miller every step of the way when he prematurely became IJ. There is no such more to be said about there is so much more to be said about Fred, and obviously it is impossible to encapsulate all of Fred's accomplishments in this ceremony, but the beauty of it is that we get to tell the stories in increments whenever we get together. Fred's incredible impact on PAD will live on, indeed, as well as through John, who long ago took the torch that Fred lit and ran with. I learned a lot from Fred and will be forever grateful for what he did for me personally as well as for PAD. We are all so much the better for having known him. As the song goes, here's to Fred, he's a dime, damn fine man. This one was meant to come in letter form because it doesn't have to do with a eulogy about my father, but rather it was a letter sent by Pass International Joe Deems to him on July 17, 2014 when the International Executive Board determined to name the awards ceremony at our biennial conventions after my father. And it says, Dear Fred, professional, competent, diligent, courteous, civil, thoughtful, generous, considerate, empathic, humble, patient, calm, practical, resourceful, creative. Give me time and I will think of more words which describe the Fred that we've come to know and respect for all these years. While in my case, that is only 42 years, I am confident that those with whom you have known longer would come up with some list because the word consistent also comes to mind. Your time spent just helping others in our profession is a legacy which few can legitimately lay, lay claim to. Your practical approach to problem solving is legend. Your ability to truly lead by example is underscored by the fact that you rarely, if ever, wanted anything, even recognition, in return for your life's contributions that have touched all of us. You are truly an exemplar of the greatest generation, representing a lifetime of selfless dedication in those principles and ideals as a way of life that we should all emulate. Bravo, brother. If I was still on the board, I'd name the whole damn fraternity after you. <laughs> but then again, I'm not, so you'll just have to live with this letter as the only way I can embarrass you and say thanks. Refer fraternally yours, Joseph E. Deans. Would ask that uh, our International Associate Tribune, Ronald J. Winter, please come forward. Thank you, John. Brothers and sisters, Ron Winter, Alden Chapter, Buffalo Law School, International Associate Tribune, Niagara Frontier Alumni Chapter of Justice, Past International Justice. My bad. I saw John Whitecamp last night, and when I arrived, uh, he noticed on my tag it said speaker. He said, You're going to speak tomorrow? I said, Yes, I'm doing a subject on chapter operations. He said, No. Are you going to speak tomorrow? I said, yes, I will. The good thing about going last is that you get to hear all of the accolades bestowed upon the person that we're here to memorialize. The bad thing about going last is that all of those folks have said all the great things that I had hoped to say about Fred, but I'll forge on as he would want me to. Um, my relationship with Fred was somewhat unique among those people in this room and indeed in our fraternity, and that is I worked for Fred. Now, we all worked for Fred in those days, but I was an employee of the executive office in Granada Hills, California for a period of time. 
So I got to see and know a little different side of Fred Blake Hampton. Some of you folks get to see and know. I first met him, and I use that term loosely, in 1978 in Cleveland, Ohio, at my very first convention as a law student from Buffalo. I was 23. He was 50. I sat there in awe. And indeed, Brother Bauer, awesome is an expression that's way overused. And I agree with you. <coughs> How was the meatloaf? It was awesome. Really? <laughs> the meatloaf was awesome. There are few people for whom that term should be reserved. Fred Blankamp was one of them. I sat at the Bondport Hotel Ballroom in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1978, and I witnessed in awe what Fred Blankamp could do to put on a convention to bring people from all parts of the country, indeed the world, to one location and put on a first class professional conference. And it was for that reason. I can tell you that when I left to go back to Buffalo, I said, I'm finding a way to get back to this thing. I'm coming back every time, and I've done that. And that was largely Fred. So I really didn't get a chance to meet him, but I got a chance to see him in, in action. <coughs> and I was spelled out. And in 1980, I did uh, keep my word. I went back to the convention in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And again, I, I marveled at what he was able to do. Organized all the words that Joe Deems put into his letter and more. And then I learned in 1981, as I was graduating, they were looking for someone to travel the country on behalf of the fraternity. And I applied for that job. And I remember in the spring of 1981, I walked out of my apartment in North Tonawanda, New York, in a suit. I went to the Buffalo Airport. I flew to St. Louis. I met with Fred. I met with the executive board. And I flew back and back to my apartment in North Tonawanda in time to go to sleep. And I thought, this is marvelous. I've never been anywhere. And in one day, I traveled to St. Louis, met a bunch of people <laughs> I love, and I'm back home. That was the beginning of what my travel experience would be for Phi Alpha Delta. You wake up one morning, I'm in a Holiday Inn. I'm not sure where I am. <laughs> because that was the travel routine. And that travel routine was worked out by Fred Whitecamp and me. And he would say, we need to go visit these places, go to these locations. I don't care how you get there, just get there and deal with the situation there. I learned when I got the job and moved to Granada Hills, California, one week after the bar exam in August of 1981, that I was in for a very interesting experience, getting to know Fred on a personal level, walking into his office when he would summon me. And he was so busy and a man of so few words, that when he summoned you, and keep in mind this is 1981, there was no texting or, or email or any such thing, I would get a green sheet. None of you know what I'm talking about. We had these <laughs> green sheets of paper, and at the top was everyone's initials. It would be to RJW, from FJW. And all I saw in there written in pen was C. Didn't even take the time to spell it S-E-E. <laughs> Letter C, me. Let me tell you something. When you meet a guy like Fred Whitecamp and you're in awe of him, and you see at that first convention this large, imposing presence, and then you go to work for him, and he's serious, all business, stern. You don't want to get a C me from Fred Whitecamp. <laughs> it can't be good. I'm happy to say that, for the most part, it was generally good when I went to see him. There was a follow-up on, on some travel we were doing, etc. And so that was the business side of Fred, but then there was another side. Because as I traveled then, starting in the fall of 1981, I'd go out for two weeks, I'd be in a different place every day, and I'd come back again and do reports and get ready and go out again. And one of those trips in November of 1981 found me finishing up in Boston. And then he permitted me, Fred did, to fly to Buffalo, where I could pick up a vehicle, leave there in a car on Saturday morning, drive all day Saturday and all through the night, and all day Sunday and all through the night, stopping occasionally to get gasoline and coffee and some sleep. 
and all through the day and night on Monday to get back to Granada Hills, 2,600 miles. Tuesday morning when I came in, I was near death. And I did my best to keep it together and, and do the job that we were there to do. And later in the day, Fred came by and he said, I'm going to let you go home, but he said, before I do that, I need to ask you something. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? So, well, Fred, I, I just got back there from Western New York, so I had no plan to go back there. I, I don't know, I'll just hang out in my apartment because that's four days, man. He said, you're coming with us. So I became part of the White Camp family. I got in the, I don't remember what the, the travel arrangements were. I just know that I found my way from Granada Hills through some mountain roads and canyon roads, and somehow we ended up in Malibu, Pacific Coast Highway, at this fantastic beach house that you've heard about, but never seen. And I spent four days hanging out with the White Camp family. And that was great. I stood out on the balcony, which ran the whole back of the house, looked out on the Pacific Ocean, I glanced to my right and I said, hey, Fred, is that your neighbor? He says, yeah. I said, isn't that Rod Stewart? <laughs> That's Rod Stewart. Amazing, just amazing. But think about that, how generous a man he was to just say, you're not my employee today. You're back. So, I made it a point after I left his employment in 1983 to telephone him on November 14th every year <clears throat> to say happy birthday. And Fred was a man of few words, so the conversation didn't have to be lengthy, but <clears throat> it had to take place, at least from my perspective. And so I did that every year. And after a while, he invited me to come out and stay at the beach house. He would offer that every time I saw him at convention, etc. And I would say, well, Fred, that's very nice of you, but no, I don't know. Very kind of you, Fred, to offer, but no. Finally, one time I turned to my wife and I said, we should go. <laughs> and we did. And let me tell you what happened. My wife was a school teacher at the time, now retired. She couldn't get away at the same time I could get away. So I got on a plane with my two young daughters, and we flew to Buffalo to Philadelphia to Los Angeles, except we got delayed in Philadelphia. So I get a hold of Fred and I said, my plane's not going to be there at 6 o'clock, but like we planned. It's going to be there at 10 o'clock tonight. He said, okay. And we get off the plane and we walk down the ramp and there's Fred White came. White short sleeve shirt, blue pinstripe slacks, clearly part of the suit he wore all day that day, and a tie. He says, let's go. And he packed us up into a Suburban. And we drove straight out from the airport right up the Pacific Coast Highway to the beach house. And when we got there, he handed me the keys to the sorority, and the keys to the house. He says, enjoy yourself. And he got in another car with a gentleman named Fred, and he drove away to his home in Northridge, California. And there I was, me and my two daughters in the beach house. And oh yes, I did go pick up my wife two days later. <laughs> Thank God I knew my way around because I used to work out there. But that's how generous he was. What a great man he was. When it came time to celebrate his 90th birthday, I said to Joan, we're going out to California. We're going to be there for this. Because I don't know how many times I'm going to see him again. So we did. And I'm glad I did. But even then, he's 90. I'm 63. He's still the boss. I'm still intimidated by him. <laughs> we had a conversation, and I still felt like that 26-year-old that went to work for him in California. He still had that presence. Well, we got to Lexington in 2018. The first thing I said to John Whitecap, is your father here? He said, no. Health wouldn't permit him to be here. And I knew that I might not see him. And indeed, in September, when I learned he had passed, I was stunned, but not surprised. We should all get 90 years. And then my father passed away at 88 in January. And I've said this before publicly, I'll say it again. I loved my father, but I was envious of John White Camp. Because Fred White Camp was his father, not mine.
For 21 months, Fred Whitecamp was my employer and my mentor. He taught me to set a goal and achieve it through hard work and determination. He taught me the confidence to enter a room <coughs> and win over its occupants. He taught me to love Dad unconditionally. He taught me how to be a man. I know for as long as I live, I'll never measure up to what Fred was. But I'm going to keep trying, because he would want that. Thank you, my brother, and from my father, you did mentor. Father, mentor, brother, employer, law partner, and so much more. That was our executive director emeritus, a.k.a. Dad. He opened up the world of PAD to not just me, but to so many of our brothers and sisters during his 40 years as executive director. He was a shining example of PAD fraternalism at his best. He truly led by example. Philos, Adelphos, Dikaios were not just words to him, but a way of life, a credo that he lived as much for himself as he did for Phi Alpha Delta. For four decades, he worked with the Supreme and International Executive Boards to shape PAD for the future. The results, we had 17 law fraternities in existence in the 1970s. We now have one chapter left of Gamma Eta Gamma, two of Sigma Nu Phi, Delta Theta Phi is hanging on by its fingernails. Phi Delta Phi gave up being the most important thing to us, being a fraternity, to become a society because they didn't want to compete with us any longer. So we are the one thriving law fraternity that is left in this world. The best testament that there can be for our departed brother is that you, our younger members who are our future. Continue your involvement in Phi Alpha Delta and that you not just wait for the future, but help shape the future for Phi Alpha Delta so that we will continue to provide professional, competent service as well as integrity, compassion, and professional service. Sorry, our speakers got to me a little bit. I am now about to order that the seat of our deceased brother be removed from its place, not again to be used until some new member shall come into our fraternity, as sooner or later all of our places must be taken by those who succeed us. While this is being done, let us all silently contemplate the contributions of our deceased brother to our fraternity and to our lives. Will all members please stand? The International Secretary will note on the permanent rule of the records of Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity International the death of our dearly departed brother. My sisters and brothers, please be seated. Now let us proceed to carry on the work of our fraternity as it must be carried on, no matter what losses we may suffer or what lives may be taken from us. We are all part of a great stream that flows onward through the years towards a common end. During the brief sojourn of our existence, we can so fashion our lives that not even the obscurity of the future can erase our memory from those of the hearts and minds of those who have come to know us. Here today, we strike off from the role of the living, the name of Brother Frederick J. Whitecamp. But what he has done as a member of our fraternity, not even time itself can strike from the memories of the living. Our works will pass, even as we pass on, there lives only the spirit. But in the spirit of this fraternity, the contribution of fraternal service and loyalty 
of our departed brother will live on long after we who are now here are gone. And now let us remember that work still remains in our hands to do and resolve to build the, to the memory of all of our deceased members a fitting memorial, a living fraternity which never dies. Phi Alpha Delta. Let us go about the business of our fraternity. Thank you.